could I just um, check, Ajahn? Um, the sound is okay, but it's not perfect. I wonder if you were a bit closer to the computer, it might be clearer. Oh, okay, sure. I can probably come a bit closer. Okay. That, that might be clearer. Does that help? I think that's a bit clearer. What do other people think? Yeah? Thumbs up. Is it, is it better? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a bit better. Thank you. It's, okay. it's, good enough. Can, it's definitely good enough. I'll just, I'll, I'll just speak up a little bit. I should be able to talk a little bit louder. Okay. So uh, anyway, let's see what happens here. And uh, uh, as you start out your meditation, just close your eyes. Uh, and the magic of closing your eyes is that you can feel your body so much better, uh, shutting out so much of the world. Uh, so just feel the body as you start out, just allowing yourself to relax, uh, not doing anything in particular, uh, just allowing things to unwind all by themselves. And one of the tricks of meditation is to know exactly the right amount of effort to make. And the right effort in meditation is a bit like coming home from the long days of work and just relaxing in your favorite armchair. It's just a letting go really, allowing things to be, not really pushing your mind in any one direction.
And uh, as you do this, just allow the world to fade away. And it's almost as if you're going into your own little cave, the one little place of safety within yourself. Uh, and allow everything in the world to fade into the background. Uh, and just relax and enjoy that safety within you. And once you reach a certain degree of calm inside you, you can then take the meditation in pretty much any direction you like. And for this time, I want to see if we can focus just a little bit on the idea of death and, and see if we can deepen the calm and the peace by doing that. So start out by imagining yourself that you're in a room, a room which is very simple. There's nothing in there except for the white walls. Uh, there's no window. Uh, there's nothing, de no decoration anywhere. Uh, and the door is closed. Uh, there is a very simple bed with a thin mattress. Uh, and you're lying on your back. Uh, the garment you're wearing is like a white hospital garment. Uh, there's nothing to it, nothing in here at all, which is interesting. Uh, and you know that you have said goodbye to all your friends and family and acquaintances. Uh, and from here on, there's only maybe a few hours, uh, and you know that that will be your final passing away. Uh, so just lie on that bed for a while, uh, and just feel what it feels like, just remind it.
and uh, this make a mental note of what it feels like and for now and come back to this later on. You also notice the kind of effort you have when you're lying on your bed table. You're lying there waiting to come to the very end of your life. And what is the effort involved in that? And you will notice something beautiful about that effort and how relaxed it is and how natural it is. And uh, as you are lying there, essentially just waiting to pass away, uh, you start to realize that uh, from here on in, uh, there is nothing but a process of letting go of all the way. Uh, you have to say goodbye to all the things of this world. Uh, and the, one of the most obvious things that you have to say goodbye to uh, is all your material possessions. Uh, so let go of those material possessions. So, See if we can feel that freeing of the mind that comes from the act of letting go. And as the moment of passing away is getting closer and closer, it's becoming more and more obvious that you have even more things in this world to let go. All your friends, all your acquaintances, and all your family relations, and even the people who are closest to you, now is the time to say goodbye. To say goodbye in your mind or in your heart, then carry on by yourself into the future.
what does it feel like to be all by yourself and moving on into the future? And uh, the moment of that is getting ever closer now. There's even more things you realize that you have to let go of. One of the important things we have to let go of on this journey is so much that has to do with our identity and who we take ourselves to be. So much of that is tied up with this world. And as we are about to leave this world, we have to let go of all of that. These things include things like your status and gender and, and your education level and all of these other things. So whether you are a monk or a nun or a lay person, all of those things have to go as well. It's as if your identity is gradually being erased. So carry on, allow that erasure to happen and move onwards and towards your final passing away. And what does it feel like to give up so much of your identity? And as you're getting closer and closer, you can feel that even the things that are 
for the most part of your life, but your identity and even your body that the body as well has to go towards the very end. Let's uh, see if we can let go of the body in the sense that the body becomes out of reach and out of control. That let go of the sense of identifying with this uh, heavy thing in this life. And uh, as you allow the body to fade into the background, uh, there comes a point when you're no longer sure whether you are dead or alive. Uh, and you realize it doesn't really matter. Uh, because by letting go of all of the burdens of this world, uh, you actually feel a sense of lightness and delight and a beautiful sense of emptiness and something. Uh, if you can feel that sense of being unburdened, uh, Move forward into the future, uh, this unburdened and empty state of mind. And you start to realize that what a beautiful thing the experience of death actually is. And you wonder why you were ever afraid of this particular experience. If you do it in the right way, in the wise way, there's a certain unburdening of the mind and freedom and liberation from the entire world. And as you experience this, you feel a sense of gratitude a sense of gratitude to the whole world, that the whole world that has supported you and made this journey at the very end. Such a beautiful and marvelous thing.
And uh, now, if you wish, uh, you can just stay with a feeling of emptiness or gratitude or whatever it is that you have. Or uh, if you wish, the breath turns up in your awareness uh, and very gently, you can go with the breath for a while and see how it develops. And now we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Before we come to the very end, just ask yourself, how do you feel now? If you do feel more relaxed or more mindful or more at ease or whatever it is, ask yourself why that is the case. What is the process that leads up to this thing? Okay, so that is the uh, end of the meditation. Please come out and sit comfortably down. Okay, yeah. So uh, I guess I can just carry on from there. Is that right? Yeah, okay, very good. So we'll just carry on. Then. And uh, so uh, that is just the idea. This is a, a kind of death contemplation. Yeah. There's many ways you can do that, as many, as many ways as there are people. So just uh, you have to try out the way that it works for you. Yeah. But the idea is to get into the feeling of letting go and letting things be. Yeah. But you can carry on with an unburdened mind. And this is very powerful. It's powerful because the process of meditation and the process of dying are so closely linked to each other. They're both processes of letting go, yeah, of allowing the world to be and not controlling and all of these kinds of things. So they become very, when they are integrated like this, they can become very powerful and they can work together in a very useful way. You may remember I started out by saying, what does it feel like to, just to lie there on your deathbed? Yeah? <laughs> Some people don't want to lie on their deathbed at all. They find it kind of frightening. And if you do find it frightening to lie on your deathbed, then please don't do it. 
ways till you feel at ease with it and you can relax with these things. Uh, but if you are at ease with that, and many, many people are at ease with it, uh, then uh, the idea by just feeling what it feels like, the idea is to find out whether you are ready to die. Yeah? Is there any hindrance in you? Is there some kind of obstacle by the people that you have some you know, things that you want to talk to or say something about? And very often you can feel that uh, when you come to the very end of your life. But this is the opportunity to sort out any stuff which actually needs to be sorted out before you die. Once you are on your real death, that is going to be too late. And so now is the chance. That is the point of that. So I'm going to uh, broaden out the topic a little bit. I'm going to talk about uh, the idea of death in more general. Uh, and Venerable uh, Chanda has asked me also to talk a little bit about my personal experiences because I've uh, recently had some close family members who passed away. And of course, that's very, from my point of view, it was very interesting when that happened. Uh, precisely because we contemplate death so much. It is fascinating to see how you are going to react. Yeah, you are a monk, you're supposed to, you think you have it all together, but sometimes maybe you don't. And so it's fascinating to see your own reaction when these things actually happen. But the idea of death, when you start reading the word of the Buddha, one of the things that you find is that it is so prevalent, yeah, it is so ubiquitous, it is everywhere, basically, in the sutras. Uh, and uh, this is one of the ways that you know that this was an important idea for the Buddha, yeah, that he talks about in so many different ways to different people and different places. Uh, and if you look at all the different meditation techniques and perceptions and uh, developments of the mind that the Buddha was talking about, uh, one of, what I would say one of the most important ones actually is uh, the death contemplation itself. Uh, it is so uh, central to the way the Buddha thinks about the world and how uh, we deal with uh, uh, letting go and all of these kind of things. Uh, so it is very important contemplation. The Buddha specifically says that uh, it should be done by everyone, yeah? whether you are a lay person or a monastic, uh, whether you are a woman or a man. In, the, in other words, everyone should do this. Uh, it doesn't say whether you are a deva or a human, but probably even devas too should actually do the death contemplation. So any devas who are listening to this talk, please take note. <laughs> and uh, so that, it's very significant. And one of the uh, interesting things that the Buddha says in the sutta, he says that if you want to take your spiritual path all the way to the end, yeah, all the way to awakening, all the way to the final goal of the Buddhist path, that, and the death contemplation is one of the fundamental parts of that path that leads to the very end of, the, uh, of this practice. So, yeah, it is one of those things that actually take you to the culmination of this path. Uh, so again, it shows you how core it is, how central it is to all of this thing. Uh, so now that we are in this uh, very strange situation around the world with the coronavirus and the COVID-19 and all of that, uh, Let's not waste that opportunity. Yeah, for many people, it is a scary, it is frightening, it is a difficult time, it is emotionally difficult. And of course, I, I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, to underestimate the difficulty that people have. That's fair enough, people are having a hard time. Right? But for those of us who are on a spiritual path, actually, it is also an opportunity to get closer to the Buddha's teaching, to understand now you are faced with a certain reality. Yeah? And sometimes uh, we need to be faced with things before we really grasp the significance of what it is all about. Uh, one thing is reading about the death contemplation, uh, the Marana Sanya, as it is called in the Sutta, the Marana Sati, uh, the recollection of death or the perception of that. Uh, but another thing is to actually feel it personally. Uh, and this is an opportunity to feel these things more powerfully. Uh, and then uh, you will, it will actually take you closer to the spiritual path if you use this in a wise way. So in a sense, yeah, it is like everything in life, coronavirus can be bad, but it can also be good. Yeah, there is a large silver lining there. In fact, I often say it's not, not a silver lining, it's a silver cloud with a gray lining around it. Yeah, so it's actually the inverse. There's a, whole, there's a massive opportunity for all of us to use this in a wise way if we really have that right attitude about this. Uh, so, and this is what is, makes it so interesting. And this is what makes the Buddhist teaching so different. The idea that the 
suffering and problems can be used in a positive way. And, but still, I, I only kind of touched the surface when I uh, talked about you know, the importance of marana sati or death contemplation in the suttas. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to me not so long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, is that in fact the entire Buddhist teaching is actually founded on the contemplation of death. Uh, it comes from there. The awakening of the Buddha himself actually came originally from uh, this uh, contemplation of death in a very powerful and deep way. And you find this in the suttas when the Buddha talks about himself, but he talks, you know, it's basically his autobiographical suttas and he talks about how, what life was like before he became a monk and before his awakening and all of that. And and there's a couple of suttas where he goes into quite a bit of detail about what he actually did. And one of those suttas, he talks about, you know, the uh, kind of the luxury that he lived in and, and he had the best kind of clothes and he had the best kind of food and he had nice parents who looked after him. And, and it says about that he had a, he, they carried a white cloth over him day and night so he wouldn't, no dust and dew would settle on his body. You know? That's kind of quite, uh, quite nice. And then he had three houses, one for the winter, one for the summer, and one for the, uh, the, the rainy season. He had three lotus ponds. He was a young man who had three lotus ponds. And so that, that was kind of the equivalent of the, I guess, the uh, entertainment kind of PlayStation people have today. And those days they had lotus ponds instead. <laughs> That's kind of sweet, isn't it? It's kind of a more innocent time than these days. But this uh, whole idea behind it is that he lived in a, you know, in a, luxury, in a sense of in the degree of luxury that compared to what most people live at that time. And then he also realized that the realities of life, and this is what kind of was the initial point that actually started him out on the spiritual journey. And what were the things that he realized? Well, he realized there is a serious problem with life. I have all of these things. And yet there is illness and there is old age and ultimately there is death. And uh, uh, of those three things, uh, yeah, of illness, death and old age, death is the most powerful one because death kind of includes illness and old age into it. Yeah? Yeah, so death is the most powerful one. And what happens for the Buddha to be thinks about these things? What happens is that he says he loses his intoxication with life. One of those beautiful things in the suttas is that intoxication does, doesn't just mean that you're using alcohol or drugs. Uh, intoxication is much broader in the suttas. It's anything that clouds your mind, uh, that distorts your outlook, uh, that biases your mind in favor of something which actually isn't all that useful for you. Uh, that is intoxication. Uh, so once you understand that, then your attraction, uh, your interest in all the worldly things, uh, the interest in everything, all those things that you have to give up when you die, they, it, it kind of vanishes. Yeah? If it doesn't vanish completely, at the very least, it vanishes a little bit. Uh, and when that desire, that attachment for the world uh, dies down, uh, the clarity of the mind arises in its place. Uh, why? Because essentially, these are the hindrances in, in the, on the Buddhist path. Uh, equivalent in large part to the things we call the five hindrances and yeah if you let that go clarity arises and that is what happened to the buddha and then as a consequence of that then of course eventually he decides to go forth to become a monk and to give up the whole life because of that that is one of those suttas there is another sutta which is even more powerful in the world this is a very famous sutta and I would really recommend you to read it if you haven't read it before. Yeah? And for those of you who haven't read the suttas, I'm sure there are some of you who don't read the suttas. The suttas can be so beautiful, so inspiring. It can in, please get into the suttas. Now really, I don't know, they draw you into the Dhamma in an entirely new way. There's a power to the word of the Buddha that you can never find in any ordinary Dhamma talk. Yeah? So try it out and see what you do. What you, how it feels like for you. And this particular sutta is called, in the Pali language, it's called the Arya Pariyasana Sutta. And Arya is noble. So this literally means the noble search. Yeah, sounds good, right? Noble search. It sounds like kind of a good starting point. So this noble search is the Buddha's search for awakening. And that's what it's all about. And then, of course, what happens after the awakening as well. 
And uh, what the Buddha says in this particular sutta, he is kind of living the home life, the ordinary life. Uh, and then he says to himself, uh, here I am, subject to old age, sickness, and death. Uh, and then what do I do? I go out searching for other things too, that also are subject to the same things. Uh, also subject to sickness, old age, and death. Uh, what are those other things? Well, they are all the people that we attach to in this world. Uh, and the Buddha specifically says wife and children, yeah, which is what you would expect. And then he goes beyond that, he talks about possessions, yeah, the possessions of the world at that time were things like uh, uh, cattle and uh, uh, whatever possessions you have. And they are also subject to death in the sense that they are impermanent. Uh, one day they're going to have to leave you there and they're going to have to be left behind there. And the Buddha to be asking himself, how can I? If I am subject to these difficulties already, if at the end of my life I'm going to have to give everything up, it doesn't make any sense to go out searching for more of the same. Or should I turn my attention towards something else, towards a liberation, a freedom from that old age, from that illness, and from that death? Why hold on to things that you know you're going to have to let go of? Why attach to things that are not going to last? attached to things that down the track are going to give you sorrow and pain, all kind of suffering. Let's see if there is a solution to this problem instead. And this then becomes the noble search, the search which is so different from the vast majority of people in the world, you know, the vast majority, the search for things that they can attach to, things that they can hold on to, but things they cannot bring with them after the point of passing away. But the Buddha, yeah, and this is kind of the interesting thing about the Buddha is this audacity, yeah? this feeling, this confidence that, you know, I can do things differently from the whole world. Yeah? And then going out, searching for a solution to the idea of death. Yeah? It's pretty audacious, yeah? How many people do you know who kind of say, yeah, I'm going to set out now and search for the end of the, the solution to death. Yeah? It's not an easy thing to do. And this is exactly what is so powerful about the Buddha. So he does that. He, of course, he goes out and then eventually through his practice, and I'm not going to go through all the details about that, then, but through his practice, uh, through this search, uh, he does then eventually find that solution to death, to old age and illness. But death being here, the core thing that he finds the solution to that. Yeah. But what you will have, so he, and finding a solution, of course, is then often called the deathless, or I think better to call it the liberation of freedom from death, the liberation from the problem. Yeah, that's what it really is. But what you will have noticed that in this tale, and this is why I'm basically telling it, is that the motivating factor, what has driven this man two and a half thousand years ago, driven him on this journey, the spiritual journey, is not the things we normally hear about, compassion, kindness to everyone, wanting to get everyone out of suffering. Yeah. There's nothing like that mentioned at all. There's only one thing really mentioned, uh, and that is the problem of death. So in a sense, and this is what is so powerful about this, in the sense, the entire Buddhist teachings, uh, the reason why we have the Tipitaka now, we have all the suttas, uh, the reason why we still have people practicing these marvelous teachings in the present day is because one man, two and a half thousand years ago, he later became known as the Buddha because he contemplated death in a very profound way. That is why we have Buddhism. That is the source, the root motivating factor in it that has made everything else possible. So that shows you the potential. Yeah, the potential of death contemplation is actually pretty awesome when you consider two and a half thousand years afterwards, we're still here, yeah, because one man contemplated death, we are sitting here doing the similar thing two and a half thousand years later. We wouldn't expect it to have that kind of results, but there you are. It does actually have those kind of results. And that is how powerful it is. And because of that power, we, you know, we should really um, not neglect this kind of meditation precisely because it has the potential to change our outlook and maybe also take us to that same path, that same awakening that actually uh, took, it took the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. Huh? So that is the, um, a little bit about the power of the uh, death contemplation. If we do it in the right way, it has these awesome kind of consequences. Huh?
And of course, once the Buddha had reached his awakening, then uh, the idea of compassion, that's where the idea of compassion fits in. Uh, he had now find a, found a solution to the problem. Uh, and because he had found a solution to the problem, now is the time to bring it out into the world and tell people, I found the solution. That's where the compassion comes in. Now he wants to share that message with the rest of the world. Uh, and it's a far more logical sequence to the whole thing. First of all, you find a solution. Then the compassion builds up because you know that you have the solution to the problem that everyone in the world is looking for, and the solution for him. Of course, then you go out and you start teaching it as a consequence. So um, that is uh, uh, what the Buddha did. And uh, then his awakening, and then he started teaching. And then, uh, of course, one of the things that he taught was precisely the death contemplation itself. Yeah, so this became part of his teachings, and often he teaches the death contemplation very beautifully. You know, they are uh, one of the marvelous things about the suttas that I would really uh, uh, suggest that you look out for when you read the suttas is all the similes and all the metaphors that the Buddha uses. Uh, they're often very powerful and very useful. And one of the similes he used to actually explain the idea of death contemplation. And uh, on this particular, there's one particular occasion, uh, there's actually a large number of occasions of uh, uh, this uh, king called Pasenadi of Kosala, a very famous king at that time. Uh, he was the king of one of the largest empires in northern India two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and he was a disciple of the Buddha and he would come to the Buddha regularly. Yeah, like, you know, this uh, large, quite a large number of suttas uh, with King Pasenadi coming to the Buddha. If you want to look up those suttas, and they are found in the Sangyutta Nikaya, and you'll just look up King Pasenadi in the, in the Sangyutta Nikaya. And so he would come to the Buddha, yeah, and then in this particular one case, uh, he comes to the Buddha, and the Buddha says to him, well, great king, why are you coming in the middle of the day? Yeah, and the idea of coming in the middle of the day is a long time to come to see a monk. You're supposed to come in the evening when the monks are kind of ready to meet you. You're not supposed to come and see them at any old time. That's considered a bit disrespectful, yeah, and it's a bit kind of uh, too eager, perhaps, to kind of get the Dhamma or whatever. How come you're coming in the middle of the day? Yeah. And then uh, King Pasenadi, he uh, talks about how kind of upset he is about, you know, about the, all the things that are going wrong with the and royal court and all of these kind of things and how difficult it is and he basically wants some advice from the Buddha. And then the Buddha says to him, great king, what do you think? Imagine that the man would come to you from the south and this man who comes from the south, he will tell you, your majesty, you should know that there is a great mountain coming from the south, moving in this way, crushing all living beings. And great king, what would you do if that happened? And the king replies, if that happened, uh, 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 Lord or Master, whatever you call the word of Venerable Sir, if that happened, Venerable Sir, what I would do, I would do what we have to do. I would do good and do my best to practice in the right way. Because what else can you do when you are faced with this kind of calamity, this kind of disaster? And the Buddha says, well, what if there's another mountain coming from the east? And the man coming from the east said, there's a great mountain coming this way, crushing all living beings, closing in at any time. There's another mountain coming from the west, crushing all living beings. There's another mountain coming from the north, crushing all living beings. What would you do, great king, if that were the case? And again, the king says, well, of course, what I would do, I would do good, make a safe place for myself. So I, I could... Uh, have that good karma to move me on into the future. Yeah. And then uh, the king says, uh, uh, sorry, the Buddha says to the king, uh, I announce to you, great king, I proclaim to you that death and all age are advancing on you, just as that great mountain is advancing on you. Uh, death and old age are advancing forward, just like a mountain crushing all living beings. Uh, in the same way, death and old age also crush all living beings in their wake, yeah. and this is the problem. Yeah. And then, of course, the king said, Sadhu, 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 that being the case, what can I do except living well, doing what is right, yeah, and uh, living in a wholesome manner to create that sense of security for myself? Yeah. 
It is such a powerful simile. I remember reading this many years ago, and this idea of a mountain moving towards you. You don't know how far away it is. It could be just around the corner. I don't know if mountain go, mountains go around corners, but you get the idea. It's a big mountain just kind of out of sight, yeah? Coming your way, crushing all living beings. Yeah? Everything is being crushed, and you don't know when is your turn. It could be just any time. It's a very powerful idea because, of course, a mountain, if the whole mountain is moving, it is, there's no chance of you kind of getting out of the way. There's no way that you can escape them. It makes it very clear that you are, this is, you are doomed in a very powerful way. And it's this idea of being doomed, of knowing that there is no escape from dying, which is so powerful because this is what allows us to let go of the material world and all the things around us that very often we get deluded by and we get intoxicated by. This is one of these powerful similes that you find right there in the suttas. And I remember when I first read it 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I can't remember now, a long time ago, it kind of sent some shivers down my spine in a sense, because you realize straight away the truth of these things when you see them. There are many other beautiful similes in the suttas about uh, death and dying. Uh, and just very briefly, there is uh, another sutta called, which I, which I often uh, like to quote, is called the Araka Sutta, found in the uh, uh, numerical discourses of the Buddha, the Anguttara Nikaya, the sevens, I think it is, uh, 774 or something like that. And, and in the Araka Sutta, this is about some sage who lived a long time ago. And this sage who lived a long time ago, he, he taught his disciples in, in this particular way. He said, uh, disciples, uh, yeah, life is short and full of suffering. Uh, now is the time to do what is good and avoid what is bad. Uh, yeah, and then he has all this number of sim large number of similes about how short life is. Uh, and one of those similes is the simile of the dew on the blade of grass. Uh, and it says, life is just like the dew on the blade of grass. Uh, but soon as the sun comes out and shines on that blade of grass, the dew evaporates. Uh, in the same way, life is short, yeah? It is short as the dew lasting on that blade of grass. Bang! The sun comes out and then everything evaporates as a consequence. And then we come to the, after all of these similes, we come to the end of the sutta. And at the very end of the sutta, the, uh, this, uh, the Buddha says, yeah, and at that time, the lifespan of human beings was 60,000 years. Life is short, yeah, and full of suffering. The lifespan was 60,000 years. That kind of brings home the point yeah, that in our present age, well, if it was short then, then now it's like a finger snap and it's all gone. Yeah. So again, this useful simile is to remind us that uh, it is so uncertain what will happen around the corner. But uh, I would like now to uh, talk a little bit about my own experience with these things. Uh, and uh, I, uh, over the last couple of years, I had two very close family members pass away and uh, very interesting as a monk or very interesting for anyone I would say to have these things happen uh, because um, you it's a kind of an opportunity to see how you react in the spiritual way it may sound very selfish to say that because you're kind of you're focusing other people's death on you but you know there's many signs to these things That's, that, that is one sign which I think is very useful to look at uh, so my father passed away first, and then my sister passed away just a few months afterwards. So. And it was very fascinating and interesting. Now, I had a great advantage, of course, being a Buddhist monk. Yeah. I already knew before the passing away that you know, some of the things that I needed to do in this kind of situation. That, and one of the things that was very obvious when they're going to pass away was that I had to make sure there was no problems, outstanding issues uh, with it. Uh, you know, with either of them really. In many ways, I had already resolved those issues already many years before because I, I realized the importance of these things. Uh, but this was an opportunity to do that a little bit more, yeah, to add something extra to that. Uh, and maybe also add an extra ingredient uh, to allow my family members to, you know, to have for them to, to have a, a better death, uh, yeah, to kind of enjoy the death more, uh, not to be so stressed out about it. Uh, and so this is one of the main, one of the first things I did was to make sure that I spoke to them in a nice way. And I did write a long letter uh, both to my father and my sister before they died, 
I'm just kind of thanking them for being good companions in this life. But, and also, you know, talking about all the wonderful uh, good qualities that I saw in both my father and my sister. There. And uh, it's very powerful. I, I remember I, my, I sent this letter to my father. It was only a couple of months before he passed away, maybe even six weeks before he passed away. And then I spoke to him in the, on the phone after sending him this letter. Again. And you can tell when someone is touched by something. Yeah, You can tell that there is a sense of a, um, something there which is unusual. Yeah, And that you can feel that you have touched somebody's heart. As a son or as a close family member, it's so easy to be fault finding with our, with our parents or, or whoever it is. And then when you do the exact opposite for once, it is actually very, very powerful. And uh, I could see that. And I was so happy afterward that I actually managed to do these things just in time. And of course, the reason why I was do I did that, that was basically because I had been a Buddhist monk and I know the power of these things. So I would really recommend you to think in a similar kind of way. We have one opportunity to say what we feel we need to say to our dearest ones in this world, to say that we love them, that we care for them, to say that, you know, to kind of just remind them of, wow, we have so many good qualities. It's so often that we are so down on ourselves. So if someone else reminds you of the good qualities, well, then actually you start to look at it in a different way. It lifts you up. And it's a beautiful way of helping other people move towards them in a more positive way. So please take that opportunity yourself. This was one of the first things I did. That was with my father. And then, uh, of course, with my sister, it was actually a very similar kind of thing that, that happened. And uh, my sister was a little bit of a more difficult case in some ways, at least for me, because uh, well, with the rest of my family, they had all kind of come around to and looking at life in a new way, and they were becoming Buddhist, and they had gone to one of the retreats that the Venerable Chanda had organized in London. Yes, they were there, and everything was kind of coming together. But my sister, she was the kind of the one hold out. Yeah, she was really hard to uh, get on board and seeing the ideas of Buddhism actually might be useful for her as she was passing away. Yeah. But uh, even with her, even though she is very, was very worldly in many ways, uh, as she came closer to death, she started to realize that actually the spiritual path really matters, yeah, and she started to change. And I really knew that she had changed. When one day she came to me and just said, you know, could you please give me some uh, guided meditation so I can get on with do some meditation practice. So that was a very, very powerful thing. And then later on then, they decided to go to London and to take part in Venerable Chanda's retreat. It was my suggestion, of course, because I knew about it. And but then the whole thing kind of came out of that. Then. And that showed me that sometimes we need to really feel death. We really need to feel the danger of life, the problems of life. But we have to, it has to come quite close to us before we're actually able to act on it in the right way. Then. And that is similar to the COVID situation. It is similar to any disasters that we see in the world. That when we understand the fragility of our existence, when we understand how vulnerable we are to all of these problems in the world, uh, we become more appreciative, actually, almost automatically, even if you don't want to be, it's an almost an automatic reaction uh, that you become a more spiritual being as a consequence. So this is how things started out. And then, of course, I, uh, as time went on, then eventually uh, my father died yeah and he died suddenly quite quickly actually he didn't really die of the cancer he had to die by falling down a, a really long staircase and, and uh, so he he passed away and uh, one of the interesting things again was the reaction that you had when someone very close to you passed away yeah. and one of the things that hit me when that happened uh, the father figure yeah, father is i had a very good relationship with my parents so, and because of that, a father figure is someone who is very kind of someone you go to. Yeah, well, it could be a mother for that matter. It doesn't really make that much difference. But with my father who passed away, is someone you go to when you want to discuss something, someone you want to talk about to resolve the problems in your life. Yeah, someone who kind of has the wisdom that you haven't got. To. And I, one of the things I felt when he passed away, I thought I didn't have much attachment. So, but I realized that there was a little bit sense of emptiness there when he passed away as if a pillar in your life had been taken away, and there was a feeling that something was lacking it that had been there before. 
In that moment, I understood the danger of attachment. So, yeah, you can see the emptiness, the problem that comes from being attached to things. So, it felt like something had been taken away, and now in a slight emptiness was actually remaining. Yeah. It was a very strong feeling. It wasn't. It wasn't kind of emotional or destabilizing anything like that. But, but it was enough to notice the danger of attachment right there. Yeah. And that this idea of the danger of attachment that you know to people in this world, that it is something that I have experienced on a few occasions. So on a few occasions, you know, for example, if you think about having a relationship, for example, with somebody, then the moment I thought about having a relationship with somebody, I realized that actually what you're doing by going into a relationship, you're asking for someone else to supply a degree of happiness in your life. Yeah? That is the whole point of a relationship. You're actually going into something because you want that person. That person can give you something that your life otherwise is missing. In other words, you're seeking for happiness from some external party and bring that person into your life. And the moment I realized that, it felt terrible. It felt like, how can you rely on external people to give you a degree of happiness? As soon as you do that, you will attach. And as soon as you attach, then of course, that uh, relationship is bound to be impermanent. You know that through your, um, uh, through your experience of Buddhism and through just thinking about life in the wise way. And because you can see your attachment and the asking for happiness from an external source, at the same time knowing that this is impermanent, it gave a sense of, I felt a sense of repulsion towards the whole idea of having a relationship with anyone. That, yeah. Uh, I could see it with my father, but any kind of relationship didn't really make much sense anymore uh, because you are leaning it on a uh, something, leaning on a pillar, whatever it is. That pillar is always shaking. It is always unstable, ready to fall down at any time. Uh, if you lean on something which is unstable, about to fall down, you're going to suffer as a consequence. Uh, this was one of the insights that I had as a consequence of this. And actually, very, very useful, useful, especially if you're a monk, it's quite handy to see the danger of, of relationships, yeah, because uh, you don't really, uh, otherwise it can be very hard to sustain your monastic life. But uh, so that was a very, but it was a powerful insight to me. Yeah. And uh, I know that many of you probably have relationships. And I really don't want to turn you off the relationships, but all I'm saying, I suppose, is that um, uh, as, if you see a little bit of the danger in these things, uh, what you do is that you change your direction of life a little bit. You move more towards the spiritual path because you understand that this it is relationships, no matter how good they are, they're not sustainable. They're going to come to an end one day. And so there is somewhere else that you have to go to find true and lasting happiness. So of course, I'm not, su not suggesting at all that you should get out of that relationship or whatever, but use it in a wise way so it actually enhances your spiritual happiness. So so that was one of the um, things that happened with my father. Uh, when my sister, uh, she died again about six months after my father passed away. And uh, that was a bit different, uh, the insight I got from that. Uh, because with my sister, again, she was this very, uh, quite a worldly person. Uh, yeah, she had spent her whole life. Uh, she had two children that uh, obviously she had to leave behind. Uh, and of course, when you have children, it's a very large part of your life. Many of you will know that the children kind of take over and they become, for many people, almost their whole existence in many ways. But not only was she a, 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 did she have children, she was this very energetic kind of person. She had a big farm that she was trying to run yeah, and build it up and all of these kind of things. And she was kind of super, super energetic, one of the most energetic persons actually I've ever probably ever known in my life, she was just running around. Not sure if it was restlessness or what it was, but uh, it was probably a mixture of many, many things. Uh, but very energetic and in a good way, energetic, yeah? Often supportive and kind to people as well. Uh, but uh, the energy was always applying to worldly ends, uh, building up a farm, building up something useful in life and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, her two children, yeah, all of it was really worldly ends. Uh, and then towards the very end, uh, I visited her uh, just a couple of months before she passed away, and she was just so emaciated. She was like this kind of stick person, yeah, completely thin. Uh, and it was getting very, very obvious that she was on the way out. 
But she was always very optimistic and smiling. You wouldn't know it that she was on the way out unless you saw her. Um, but she was obviously on the way out. Then. And then she carried on with her farm and carried on with her kids uh, until she had no choice anymore. She had to go to hospital uh, because she couldn't stand on the two feet pretty much. Uh, and after going to hospital, it was only two or three days. Uh, and then she passed away. Uh, and uh, the experience I had at that point was uh, the sense of futility, uh, yeah, the sense of emptiness, the sense of vanity of the whole thing. Yeah. Here you have spent the whole life building up things and things that only belong to this world. Uh, the farm, children, relationships, uh, working really hard, putting your whole life into these things. Uh, and now you have to die. Yeah. Not only do you have to die, but you have to die early. And most people will say dying in your early 50s is, is kind of early. Yeah. yeah. So all of that she had built up uh, had to be left behind. Uh, it's almost as if her entire investment in life was in vain. None of that she could take with her into the future. And again, it was very powerful because I never really seen it quite in that way before. And the reason why you don't see it is because when someone old passes away, dies, of course, it doesn't have the same, you don't have the same, you are on the way out anyway, you kind of expect it. But when someone dies in the middle of life, in the middle of their projects, in the middle of raising their children, without seeing any real results, any real solution. Then the idea of futility, of the purposelessness of it all, really kind of strikes home in a very powerful way. And of course, we are all in the same boat. Yeah, it's the same problem for all of us. And eventually the day will come when you have to give it all up and everything has to go. We cannot hold on to these things. And then you have to ask yourself now, where should you invest? What is really worthwhile investing on, investing in, in this life? And you start to realize you can, you can still live in the world, but we have to use our worldly experience in such a way as to build up spiritual qualities and make something more out of it. So um, that is what I experienced with my father and sister. And I must admit, I feel very privileged to have been able to see the passing away of my father and sister because I learned so much from it. And they were very graceful in the way they died and everything kind of turned out really, really well. And after they passed away, I, they chose me to do the funeral services. So I went back to Norway and I did the funeral service for my father and sister, large crowds of people, none of them were Buddhist, there were barely anyone who had any religion at all. The only religion was BMWs and Mercedes, I think, that was kind of the religion of these people. And, but, um, uh, so it was powerful to be there as a Buddhist monk in this large crowd, doing a funeral service for your father and sister, saying a final goodbye to them. Again, it was a great privilege to actually be able to do that. Uh, I really feel like you've been able to kind of have a proper closure with things uh, and allow things, allow everyone to move on. So that is uh, my experience with those things. And uh, uh, it's powerful because once you see it directly, that is when it starts to touch your heart. That's when it starts to have an effect on your life. And I would um, so never think that death is a bad thing. Never think that these things are terrible. Then use them as an opportunity for spiritual growth. But, and if you do that, then even the most difficult things in life that turn out eventually to be blessings. And even though it may be hard initially, uh, as you reflect on it, as you uh, contemplate it, we use in the Buddha's teachings as your support, uh, gradually your mind comes around, yeah, you start to see things in a new way. Uh, so seeing difficult things in life as opportunities uh, rather than as uh, uh, things to be sad and depressed about uh, is really the right way to go about this. Uh. So before I come to the end, uh, because uh, time is always short on these things, uh, unfortunately, uh, and the uh, kind of mirrors life, life is short, time is always shorter. But uh, just very briefly about uh, how to use this uh, in a, in a, also in your meditation practice. Uh, and uh, what I, one of the, you know, two, a couple of things that kind of how this is useful in meditation is that one of the things that you will have noticed when we did the meditation as I started out, uh, I suggested that you feel the kind of effort that you do when you are lying on your deathbed. Because when you're lying on your deathbed, you're not making any effort. You're just kind of going with the flow. And this is, I think, a very good um, 
I think it gives a very good idea for what kind of effort actually is uh, uh, the, the ideal to use in meditation practice. Again, meditation and dying are very similar to each other because they both are about letting go, but they also are about this idea of not making any effort, not doing anything, but just kind of lying there and allowing the process to actually work out. And of course, the strange thing is that even though you're not making any effort on your deathbed, still, if you have the right attitude, you will be very peaceful. And the reason you are peaceful is because your perception is that you are dying. And that perception allows you to let go. So the idea then is to bring that perception into your life right now. Yeah, so really be on your deathbed. Now is your opportunity to be on your deathbed. You can't wait till it actually happens, yeah, because you don't know when it's going to happen. Now is the only opportunity. If you don't do it now, chances are you may never be able to do it at all. And then gradually understand this. So understand from that the kind of effort that is required in meditation, but also understand the kind of perception that is required to actually enable you to let go. That perception is the perception of the whole world fading away into the background, giving up the material world, giving up all these uh, uh, the unreliability of the external world around you, including including all the people that you know, at least temporarily in the meditation practice and everything else that belongs to this world. And if you get that right, you will feel this beautiful sense of emptiness inside because there's nothing really left to hold on to. All you bring with you at that particular point are the good qualities of your heart. Yeah, if everything else goes, all we have left are the good qualities of your heart. And that is what you take with you into the future. And that gives you an idea of why it matters so enormously that we build up good qualities inside it, because that is what is going to sustain you on that last voyage into death at the very end. And if you can use these ideas in that way, in that positive way, the idea of death, but it becomes a massive positive influence in your life, but also in your meditation practice. It will carry on forward, make you a better person, and make you a blessing for both yourself and also all the people around you. Okay, so that is a little talk for you. So uh, I think I've just got over my limits. So please, Venerable, please take, take over and then uh, whatever we're going to do next. Uh, Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> Very good. So um, I think the next thing on the program, we still have a, a good uh, 25 minutes or so, is to open up for some question and answers, if Ajahn Pramali would be so kind to oblige. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. <laughs> I'm sure that will take time for it to really sink in and do its magic. Um, so any questions that people have around that theme are welcome at this point. And uh, my wonderful co-host Mel and Anne-Marie will be helping to make sure we come to you if you have your hand up. And they will unmute you 